Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. We'll be continuing on today in a study we started last week about the mercy of God, the mercy seat, focused on the mercy seat. I think we'll end up on that today. But the focus of this is about the last days and how we have to be prepared for the perilous last days when lawlessness will increase and men's love will grow cold. All right. So let me start by doing this. Father, we just appreciate the fact that you give us time together in your word. We thank you for your word. We especially, Father, thank you for your word that was made flesh who dwelt among us, your son, Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you that everything that was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. And Lord, all of it is breathed by you for training us in righteousness. Our desire is to walk in that righteousness that your son purchased for us on that cross. So we just praise you and thank you for this time in your word. In Jesus' name, Father, I pray. Amen. All right, so as I say, we talked last week, we started talking about the mercy seat. Now, you know, the mercy seat sits over, it's the top of the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant, which was in the Holy of Holies, this is the most holy place and the holy thing in the Jewish nation, right? Well, it still is, but in a different way now, all right? As I said, Jesus Christ is the mercy seat. And we talked about that pretty well and covered that pretty well last week. I mean, that's even the same word is used in Greek in the New Testament, all right? That's the place where God and man meet. The mercy seat is where, literally, where God and man meet. And of course, Jesus is the place where God and man come together, where they meet. But the Ark of the Covenant contains three things. As Alice, my wife, says, the answer is always three. The Ark contained manna, the bread from above that God miraculously provided in the wilderness, the word. The, ta- the two tablets that God had written with his own finger, uh, you know, the commandments of God. And the budding rose of Aaron, not rose, rod, the rod of Aaron, which well, I'll talk about why it was budding in a minute, right? So those are the three things, the manna, the commandments, and the rod of Aaron, right? Jesus said to a crowd when they questioned him, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. That's from the Gospel of John in the sixth chapter, verses 31 to 35. Jesus is that bread, that manna from heaven. The commandments that were written on stone, well, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory as, as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 14. So Jesus is, as we know, the Word. Right? He's the manna, he's the bread, he and he is the Word. Now the budding rod of Aaron was a symbol, that rod was a symbol of authority of the shepherd, the good shepherd who leads and guides the father's flock. And the fact that rod, the rod of Aaron sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms indicated the priesthood chosen by God. That's in Numbers. If you go read Numbers chapter 17, verses 1 through 8, you'll see because he, the way it was selected was the leaders of each tribe laid down that staff, that rod, and the one that budded overnight, that would be the indication of who God had chosen to be the priesthood. And it came up in the tribe of Levi, of whom Aaron was the high priest, right? So Jesus is the good shepherd and the high priest. So the three things that were enclosed in that uh, Ark of the Covenant, they are embodied in Christ Jesus. 
And now we are not like him. Are we not like him? I was going to say, aren't we like Jesus, like that ark? We carry the presence of the Holy Spirit. We are his temple. We contain the eternal word of God written on the tablets of our heart. And we are a royal priesthood. Those are the three things. You're literally like the Ark of the Covenant. We are the body of Christ. But you have to know that. You have to know who and what you are. You know, I've I, I shared before that uh, when I was first saved, people saw a difference in my life. I mean, the, the change in me was instant and significant, at to say the least. So people were constantly coming to me, people I worked with, and I was saying, what happened to you? What happened to you? And I, I couldn't really, this is back in the 70s, mid 70s, I, I didn't really know what had happened, but I did certainly know who had happened in my life, and that was Jesus Christ. But they were asking me all the time, because that was a time, I don't know if any of you remember this, you know, when the commentaries of people were saying, are you a born again Christian? Are you this? Are you a, a, a charismatic Christian? So people ask me, what you are? What, what are you? What are you? And I didn't have an answer. And I thought that was such a significant thing that I actually went and prayed. And God led me to Romans 8, where it says that those who are being led by the Spirit of God, they're the children of God. And that was the answer. You're being led by the Spirit. You're the Son of God. You're, the, you're sons of God. But you have to know that. You have to understand that you are a child of God. And as Peter says in his letter, you know, first letter, that we are a royal priesthood. We are that priesthood. We have a ministry of reconciliation. God has entrusted us with his love. And we are to share that. We are, each one of us, a child of God. And if you are a born-again, spirit-filled child of God, then you have experienced both the love and the mercy of God. You've been cleansed, forgiven of all sin, by having accepted the cleansing, atoning work of Jesus on the cross, on the cross of Calvary, where he took our sins upon himself and paid the price for sin. I, I, I hope that you appreciate that, I mean, what he has done for you, what great things God has done. So now you can say, therefore, like Paul did in Romans 8, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1. The stain of our sin has been washed away. But you hear the expression all the time, and I just want to talk about this for a second. Salvation is a free gift of God. Salvation is free. Well, that's partly true, but it certainly is not a true statement. Salvation was not and is not free. Well, for us, it's a free gift. For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. 1 Corinthians 6.20. You've been bought with a price. What was the price of that gift? The price of that gift was Jesus Christ upon that cross. The free gift was bought with a price. And what a price that was. The Lord's death upon the cross at Calvary. You see, while we were dead in sin... It says in Ephesians chapter 2, God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. That's Ephesians 2 verses 4 through 5. You see the link there though? Being rich in mercy because of his great love. Our Father's love and mercy are intertwined, interlocked. And in the same way, ours has to be also. Remember, we're commanded by Jesus. He said, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Matthew 5, 44 and 45. You have to love your enemies. Now, this is the deal that's going to really be a challenge in the perilous last days. Because lawlessness increases, the evil out there becomes blacker and darker. And the hatred of people is growing and growing and growing. How can you possibly love them? 
Well, how did Jesus possibly love us when he hung nailed on that cross and looked down at the people who had rejected him, who had no interest in him, and, and he cried out, Father, forgive them. That's the mercy of God. That's the compassion of God. That's the love of God. So we are now called by Jesus to give, or, or more accurately, to extend his love and mercy. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. Luke 12, 48. We've been given, it's an incomprehensible gift. It really is. And yet, because we've been given that gift, now we have to extend that gift to others. We're called by Jesus to extend his love and his mercy, right? It's not our love. It's not our mercy because the love of God is important to our hearts. It's the love of God at work in us. This statement of Jesus that we started with, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy, is both about giving and receiving mercy of God, the mercy of God. You can't give what you don't have. And God doesn't expect you to give what you don't have. Be careful of uh, these preachers who are telling you, you can just go use your credit card and borrow money to give, so you can give to them. God doesn't expect you to give what you don't have. I'm telling you the truth. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Galatians 6, 7. So if we are sowing or putting out mercy, we're going to receive mercy in abundance. But it's not about earning the mercy of God, but about being faithful stewards, as Paul wrote, as Peter wrote rather, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. First Peter 4.10. What God has given us, we are now stewards of, and we are responsible for. God supplied that mercy that we are now to sow, which will reap more mercy. The more you put out, the more you're going to have. You can't, you know, it's, it's like you can't give the mercy of God away and run out of it in your own life. The more you give, the more you will have. That's uh, one of the joys of walking in the Spirit of God. Because you said, see, it says in 2 Corinthians 9, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. 2 Corinthians 9, 10. We have to train ourselves to walk in the Spirit. We have to remember to be forgiving the hurt or the offense that someone has done to you. And it shouldn't be difficult for somebody who is filled with the love of God. Because as Paul wrote, love is patient, love is kind and not jealous, love does not brag and is not arrogant, love does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek it on its own, is not provoked, and does not take into account a wrong suffered. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 4 to 5. It doesn't take into account a wrong suffer. So when people do you wrong, you return right. You return love when they give you hate. This is the only way you'll be equipped for the perilous last days. I'm telling you the truth. Did Jesus not say? Yes, he did. In Matthew 7, 12. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. Don't return evil for evil. Treat them the way you want to be treated. Treat them with love. So when Peter questioned Jesus about how many times he had to forgive, right? Remember when Jesus said, how many times did I have to forgive? Seven times? And Jesus said to him, I am not say up to you up to seven times, but to seven, 70 times seven, Matthew 18, 22. How many times do you have to forgive somebody? Let me, let me paraphrase it one more time. Always one more time. You always have to be prepared to forgive somebody. And don't take offense. 
Then Jesus goes on to tell this parable. In Matthew 18, I'm going to read starting from verse 23. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle his accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who had owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. With the Lord, as with the Lord, right? Giving us love and mercy is still a price. What was the price that he paid? Death. When you get offended and hurt, and what do you have to, even unto the point of death, you've got to return love. You've got to return good for evil, even if it means you've got to die to yourself, right? Jesus said that. He, he, Jesus was saying to, to all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Luke 9.23 that's a truth that the Apostle Paul knew well. So he could say, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Galatians 2.20. Does it hurt you to forgive? Somebody did wrong to you, and you had to die to yourself. Remember the parable of that good and faithful servant. The ultimate, and I want to say this, the, you know, I, years ago I did seminars uh, all, all around, business seminars for, uh, called uh, Success in the Workplace is where it started. But I had a problem with the word success because uh, too many Christians and there are too many different definitions. So we changed it to biblical principles in the workplace. But I said this, the ultimate definition of success for a Christian then is, is, and I'm reading Matthew 25, 21. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. The only true definition of success is on the day that you come face to face with Jesus Christ, he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. If you don't hear that, I don't care what you made. I don't care what you've accomplished on earth. You, you, you're you not successful. What is the profit of man to gain the world and lose his soul? So, and now we are his ambassadors, given a ministry of reconciliation. The purpose and manifestation of God's mercy is people to be reconciled to him. We, not a church building, are the place, the temple of the Holy Spirit where the lost can meet God. We are the place where the lost can meet God. It's not about a building. They don't have to go to a, a revival service. and You know, and God can touch them any place. But like Jesus was the place where God and man met, we now are the place where God and man can meet. Because we have been, the love of God is important to our hearts. And we have a ministry of reconciliation. We have the word the good news of Jesus Christ to share with people. 
But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. 2 Corinthians 2, 14. We bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. People should be finding God in our presence because we bring the presence of Christ. Every place, every place. Not just, I mean, we're so locked into church buildings, which is an abomination. I mean, you know, it's not the house of the Lord. God said, and it says this both in the New and Old Testaments, he will not dwell in a place built by the hands of man. His, his building is made out of living stones, and that's you and I. So scribes and Pharisees, they came up to Jesus and they said, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbors as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Matthew 22, verses 36 to 40. That's the whole, that's the whole, that's, this is what our, our, it's what everything is about. It's about those two things, loving the Lord and loving others, you know, as he loved them. Satan doesn't have to get you to stop loving God. All he's got to do is get you to stop loving others. And he'll break your relationship with God. And that's the purpose of this study at this time, because this is the great danger. There is so much evil out in the world that the natural reaction is to respond and just be so angry with them, so hurt by them, so wanting to deal with them, rather than bringing them the mercy of God. Now, it doesn't mean that, that God just lets them go. And we talked about that quite a bit last week. God is a just God. He's a compassionate God. And his mercies and compassions are new day by day. But the simple fact of the matter is, there are two ministries in the world. There is the ministry of the church, a ministry of reconciliation, to bring the knowledge of God's gift of Christ Jesus into every place. And then there is the ministry of the sword that God has given to the governing powers to protect us from evildoers. That's their job, not our job. Pray, you want to pray for the government? Pray for them to do that, to fulfill. Pray for the government to do two things, or people in government to do two things. To fulfill their ministry, and their ministry is pretty limited. It's about protecting us from evildoers and punishing evildoers, and then pray that they will see the light of the glory of Christ Jesus and be drawn to him. Remember I said, it's because lawlessness has increased most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures till the end, he will be saved. The peril of these last days is not that we'll be persecuted, and, and the promise is that we will be. The peril of these last days is not that men will be lovers of self. The peril is that we'll become lovers of self. The peril of these last days is not that people are lovers of money. The peril of the last days is that we'll be drawn to that love of money. Those things, go read 2 Timothy chapter 3. These are the things that we have to be on guard against. And the only way we can be on guard against them is to be focused on Jesus Christ, the author, the finisher, the perfecter of our faith, and see the things that are important. And the things that are important are eternal life. David said that this present life, this life in the world, is but a, it's, it's just like a breath. It's just come and gone. But the gift of God is eternal life. And that's what's important. And you know what? There's no way to get it except at the mercy seat. There's no way to get it. Jesus said it. No man comes to the Father but through me. Now, you know what? That's going to offend a lot of people. Because a lot of people, even inside the church today, are saying, well, as long as you're being good, as long as you believe something. and No. Jesus Christ said, if you believe the Bible, if you don't believe the Bible, what are you doing here? If you don't believe the Bible, I don't know what to say to you. But if you believe the Bible, Jesus said there is no way to the Father except through him and his atoning work on the cross.
you need to share that love with people. You need to tell people. You need to have, it says the righteous are as bold as a lion. So why is everybody afraid to say to somebody, Jesus Christ loves you? He loves you so much that he died for you. God the Father in heaven, God Almighty, loves you so much that he sent Jesus Christ to die in your place to pay the price. Why are you afraid to say that to people? I'm telling you, if you start to do that, led by the Spirit, not leaning on your own understanding, but led by the Spirit, when the Spirit prompts you to do that, it will increase your joy by a factor of about, is it a zillion a number? And there is so much opportunity. There is always opportunity. The opportunity abounds. Alice and I had to go down to, I had have blood drums, blood labs for my annual medical checkup the other day. And we were down at the uh, VA center in the south part of Orlando, Florida. And as we were sitting there waiting, uh, one of the doctors was out and didn't show up for the day. So it was creating a lot of confusion. And one of the two women sitting behind the desk who were taking people in and everything, I heard her say, nobody's telling me nothing. Nobody's saying anything to me. So I got up and I walked over to her. And I said, you know, I, I heard you just say that nobody's saying anything to you. And I, that made me sad. So I decided to come over and say something to you. You know that Jesus Christ loves you. Well, she lit up like a Christmas tree. I'll tell you why. She got so excited. She was a Christian, but that's an encouraging word for a Christian to hear. Be as bold as a lion. Be gentle as lambs, but be as bold as a lion. And tell people. Don't be afraid to tell people. What's the worst thing that can happen if you go out and share the gospel? They can kill you to death. You think that's so, really so bad? All of the saints have gone on before. They die in the natural. But as Paul said, to live as Christ, to die as gain. Mercy is the gift of God because of his love. His love has been poured into your heart. You have been the recipient of his mercy. Go share that love. Go share that mercy with somebody today. You don't need to hand them a tract. I mean, if God leads you to do that. That's between you and God. Well, but be in tune with the Holy Spirit because he will give you the right word to say at the right time. And Brother Mark is sitting over there, and I just wanted to say something, because I know there's so much lawlessness going around, and it's so easy to get offended. But one of his favorite verses is Psalm 119, verse 165. Those who love thy law shall have great peace, and nothing shall offend them. If you get offended, if you get upset, if you get hurt by somebody, let me tell you something. That's an indication that you don't love God's law, God's word quite as much as you thought you did. Love him, love his word, love others. So Father, I just praise you and thank you that you can use us to spread the good news of your son, Christ Jesus. That you, you can use us to bring the presence, the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. That we can be the ones who bring that message of grace and mercy, of amazing grace. That is the power of your love a love that is so desperately needed in the lives of so many people. A love that many, so many Christians, they just seem not to be aware of or conscious of or operating in. Lord, help us to be faithful servants so that on that day that we see you face to face, you will indeed be saying to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I just ask that, Father, in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Well, till next time, may the Lord our God bless you. May he use you for the glory of his name. And may he use you to spread his love to the lost in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank Jesus, my Savior. Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mind.